Great. Uh, so hi, my name is Ravina Travali, and today I'm going to talk to you about a new way to evaluate page loads that explicitly considers how users interact with web pages. Uh, and this is joint work with Vikram Nathan and Hari Balakrishnan from MIT and James Mickens from Harvard. Recently, numerous studies have shown that delays of just milliseconds can lead to millions of dollars in lost revenue, as well as low ranking with search engines for web applications. As a result, there's a large incentive for both content providers and browser vendors to improve web performance and reduce page load times. So everyone agrees that web pages should load quickly, but there's actually a big question about what it means for a page to be loaded for a user. In other words, how should we define page load time to best capture user experience? Researchers and developers have tried to answer this question, resulting in numerous metrics being proposed. But to date, there's still no consensus about what the best metric is, largely because there are clear pros and cons about how well existing metrics actually relate to user experience. And so in this talk, I'll discuss several contributions that we've made towards both defining and measuring a new web performance metric called Ready Index that explicitly captures page interactivity. Uh, so first, I'll present an analytical definition for Ready Index that considers both page visibility, or whether the user can see the page's content, as well as page functionality, or whether the page's JavaScript state is ready to respond to user actions. Defining Ready Index is relatively straightforward, but measuring it is not. And so our second contribution is a practical system called Vesper that automatically identifies the state in a page that supports interactivity and measures Ready Index. Uh, third, I'll present a new framework for automatically optimizing page loads for Ready Index or interactivity. And finally, I'll discuss several user studies that we performed, which showed that uh, users with interactive goals strongly prefer pages that optimize for Ready Index. Additionally, our studies show that optimizing a page load for Ready Index can also improve user experience, even for users that don't want to interact with pages, but instead only want to look at them. Uh, so as a quick outline for the rest of the talk, I'll first discuss how web page loads work today, as well as how existing metrics evaluate them. I'll then present a definition for Ready Index and explain how Vesper measures it. And finally, I'll explain how we used Vesper to evaluate Ready Index by answering several key questions about the metric. To load a page, a client first types a URL into her browser, let's say Amazon.com, and the browser will then issue an HTTP request for the page's top-level HTML, which it'll send to the Amazon front-end server. That server will then respond with the corresponding HTML, which the browser will then process using its internal components, the JavaScript engine and the rendering engine. The JavaScript engine contains the JavaScript heap, which stores the state that's necessary for basic JavaScript computation, like the code shown here. And in contrast, the rendering engine stores the DOM tree, which is the browser's programmatic representation of the page's HTML. And as you can see from the simple example, each node in the DOM tree pertains to an HTML tag, like the body tag. Each node can also be associated with visual information, as well as JavaScript event handlers. And JavaScript code can interact with the DOM tree, uh, DOM tree through the DOM interface. As a page loads, the browser will fetch and evaluate external web objects, like JavaScript and CSS files, and as the browser evaluates each object, it'll update the JavaScript heap, the DOM tree, and the visual display as appropriate. So now that we know how page loads work today, uh, let's consider how existing metrics evaluate uh, a page load. And let's go back to our Amazon.com example. Uh, so here's a screenshot for the page along with a very simplified DOM tree and JavaScript heap. As I mentioned, there are several web performance metrics that exist today. The primary metric is called page load time, which measures how long it takes to both fetch and evaluate all of a page's objects. But looking at the screenshot, we can see that today's pages are actually quite large. And in fact, only some of the page's content is immediately visible to the user without scrolling, which is called the above the fold content. And so based on this, the page load time metric is actually too conservative. Since from a user's perspective, Below the fold content doesn't have to be fully loaded for the user to start properly interacting with the page. And so to overcome this, Google proposed the speed index metric, which evaluates how long it takes for the above the fold content to be fully rendered or visible. Uh, so speed index essentially disregards the loading of below the fold content, 
and instead requires that each DOM node that pertains to an above the fold element, like the green node shown here, are loaded. So this seems reasonable at first, but speed index has a key issue. What if the page includes interactive content, like a text box with auto completion? Speed index would be satisfied if the HTML that defines that text box is parsed and the text box is fully rendered on the screen. But it's actually JavaScript code, like the red node shown here in the heap in the DOM, that support autocompletion. And if that state is not loaded, the text box won't function properly, and this can then affect user experience. So really, speed index disregards the loading of critical JavaScript state that supports functionality in web pages. So what many users actually care about is when they can start properly using a page, or when the above the fold content is both fully visible and functional. And we may not realize it, but there are actually many JavaScript event handlers or functions that execute on certain actions like mouse movement in seemingly uninteractive pages. Uh, for example, in the Alexa top 500 pages in the US, the median page has 182 event handlers, while the 95th percentile page has over 1,200. And these handlers are responsible for all kinds of interactive tasks, like pop-up and drop-down menus, animations, uh, search features, and more. And so our goal here is actually very straightforward. Uh, we want to identify the state in a page that supports interactivity and optimize its loading. But the challenge is that developers don't annotate that state. And in many cases, they don't even know what that state is for their own pages. And so really today, we lack a way of taking a page and automatically identifying its interactive state, or the state necessary for the above the fold content to be both fully visible and functional. And so there are two main challenges with this. First, given a page, how do we automatically identify the state in the DOM tree and the JavaScript heap that support interactivity? And second, given that state, how do we mathematically define the rate at which page content becomes visible and functional? Uh, so I'll now explain how we overcome these challenges with our new measurement, uh, our new metric ready index, as well as our measurement system, Vesper. Uh, so let's start with the definition for ready index in terms of the visibility and functionality of above the fold elements. Element functionality is a binary property. Uh, so either an element is functional or it's not. So this equation essentially states that an element is only fully functional when all of its event handlers have been registered and when the state that those handlers access when fired is loaded. Next, we can define element visibility in terms of browser paint events, which is how the browser updates the screen during a page load. Multiple paint events can affect a given element during a page load. And so this equation states that an element is only fully visible when all of the paint events that affect it are complete. And here we weight paint events equally, which is similar to what speed index does. Next, when is an element actually ready? Uh, well, an element is fully ready when it's both fully visible and fully functional. And as you can tell from the halves in this equation, our current implementation weights these two properties equally. Uh, then naturally, we can define a page's readiness to be the sum of the ready values of all of its above the fold elements. And here we weight elements by their pixel area on screen, so larger elements have higher weights. And finally, we can define ready index, which tracks the progression of readiness throughout a page load to be the area above the page's readiness function. And so just like with speed index, a lower ready index value is desirable. Additionally, both ready index and speed index are progressive metrics in that they will reward a page that progressively loads content over one that loads all of its content at the end, even if they finish at the exact same time. We can, however, define a time instant metric for this called ready time, which is the earliest time until all of the pages above the fold elements are fully ready. Uh, so ready time can be directly compared to things like page load time and above the fold time, which is speed index's time instant metric, or the earliest time until all of the pages above the fold elements are visible. So what do we need to actually measure ready index? Uh, well, we need to know the page's visible elements, their event handlers, the state that those handlers access when fired, and how the browser updates the screen during the page load. And so we want to instrument pages to collect all of this information. But we have three key requirements for this instrumentation. First, we don't want to rely on any support from developers. Second, we want the instrumentation to have low overhead, so our measurements closely reflect the metric definitions. And third, we want the instrumentation to be generic, so this can work across browsers. <coughs> 
And so to measure eddy index while adhering to these three requirements, our practical system Vesper, Vesper uses a two-phase measurement approach. Uh, where in the first phase, which is performed offline, Vesper uses costly instrumentation to identify the page's interactive state. And in the second phase, Vesper uses lightweight instrumentation to only track the loading progress of that interactive state and measure eddy index. Uh, so I'll now go into a bit more detail about how these two phases actually work. So in phase one, Vesper's main goal is to identify the page's interactive state, which includes its visible elements, their event handlers, and the state that those handlers access when fired. To do this, Vesper instruments the original page and loads it to completion, uh, generating a heap in a DOM tray as I show here. And this instrumented page has several new components. First, it includes logic to determine if a given element is visible and above the fold, uh, which it does by comparing the element's bounding box to the browser's screen coordinates, as well as by analyzing the CSS rules that apply to that element to ensure that it's not intentionally hidden. Uh, and Vesper can use these techniques to identify all of the pages visible above the fold elements, which I show in green. Next, to identify the event handlers registered on those elements, the instrumented page includes shims or wrappers around each event handler registration mechanism, such that during the page load, Vesper can track the registration of event handlers, and it only logs a handler if it pertains to an above the fold element. And finally, to identify the state that those handlers access when fired, the page is also instrumented with Scout, uh, which is a web rewriting tool for automatically tracking reads and writes to both the JavaScript heap and the DOM tree during a page load. So for this, Vesper can fire each logged event handler and then analyze the resulting scout logs to identify the state in the heap in the DOM tree that the handler accessed, which I show in red. So at the end of phase one, Vesper knows the page's interactive state set, uh, and collecting this information has an instrumentation overhead of 4.5% in terms of page load times. But remember that we can now pass this information into a second, more lightweight phase of logging to actually measure eddy index. Uh, so in phase two, Vesper's main goal is to track the loading progress of the interactive state from phase one and measure eddy index. During the page load in phase two, the DOM tree and the JavaScript heap could have an evolution that looks something like this, uh, where interactive state is, uh, is essentially progressively filling in. But at each point here, how does Vesper actually know what interactive state has been loaded? Well, to understand this, Vesper uses lightweight instrumentation in the page's JavaScript and HTML code to only track critical state changes to the heap and the DOM. For the JavaScript heap, for each variable in the page's interactive state set, Vesper wants to know when that variable was fully loaded. Specifically, Vesper wants to log the last write to each one of those variables. Uh, for example, consider this code where we have two variables, x and y, that are both part of the page's interactive state set. As you can see, these variables are written to at multiple places. But because Vesper is only interested in the last write to each variable in terms of a source code line and an execution count, it only has to add these two lightweight logging statements to know when those variables are fully loaded. And so importantly, the instrumentation overhead here is lower than that from phase one where we use scout, and we wanted to log all reads and writes to all of the page's variables. Uh, Vesper uses similar techniques to track state changes to the DOM in the form of periodic DOM snapshots, but I won't go into those details here. In addition, Vesper also tracks information about browser paint events, uh, namely when they happen and what elements they affect each time. And so at the end of phase two, Vesper now has enough information to know when each element has been created, when it's fully visible, and when it's fully functional, uh, which in turn is enough to measure ready index and ready time. And the instrumentation overhead in phase two is only 1.9% in terms of load time. And so our measurements do closely reflect the metric definitions from earlier. Uh, so now I'll discuss how we used Vesper to evaluate ready index by answering several key questions about the metric. Uh, first, are the differences between ready index and existing metrics that significant? Uh, second, can we actually optimize a page load for ready index or interactivity? And third, how well does ready index actually capture user experience? Uh, so we can start with a simple result which shows how several time instant metrics would evaluate the load of Amazon.com over a 12 megabit per second link with a 100 millisecond RTT. Uh, so this timeline shows when each metric uh, deems the page to be loaded, as well as when certain critical components like the search button are fully interactive. As you can see, each of these metrics evaluates the page load quite differently. 
For example, above the fold time underestimates how long it takes for the page to be fully interactive by over two and a half seconds. And it in fact deems the page to be loaded before some of these critical components like the search button are ready for use. In contrast, page load time overestimates the page's time to interactivity by 2.72 seconds. And we observe similar trends across a wider set of uh, 350 pages in varying network conditions, as well as different browsing settings like mobile and warm cache scenarios. Uh, for example, here's a representative result for a 12 megabit per second link with a 50 millisecond RTT. And sites on the x-axis here are organized by increasing above the fold time per site. Uh, so there are two key takeaways from this set of experiments. First, we found that page load time and above the fold time can over or underestimate a page's time to interactivity by between 24 to 64%, uh, which can equate to load time differences of up to 3.6 seconds. And second, the gaps between these metrics is more exaggerated at higher RTTs, uh, since the cost of fetching each additional object that one metric requires over another is higher when the RTT is higher. Uh, we observe similar trends when comparing the progressive metrics, ready index and speed index, uh, namely that ready index is larger than speed index since it considers not only element visibility, but also functionality. Uh, and the gaps between these metrics also increase with increasing RTTs. In the next phase of our evaluation, we wanted to understand how to optimize page loads for ready index. And for this, we used Vesper and Polaris, which is a recent web optimization system that optimizes the way that a browser loads a page's dependency graph, like the example one shown here. Uh, so each node in the dependency graph represents a web object, like a JavaScript or an HTML file. And an edge means that a browser must load a parent node before it can handle its children. By default, Polaris assigns equal weight to each node in the graph. And when Polaris has to decide what object to load next, it'll fetch the object at the top of the heaviest remaining path of unfetched objects in the graph. So this strategy directly optimizes for page load time, and so I'll call it Polaris PLT. But by changing the way that Polaris assigns weights to each of these nodes, we can actually have it optimized for different metrics, and we use Vesper to do this. For example, to optimize for speed index, we want to prioritize the loading of any object that affects the visible aspect of above the fold content. And so we can use Vesper to identify these objects, and we could then have Polaris optimize their loading by assigning higher weights to them. Uh, and I'll call this Polaris SI. And similarly, for ready index, we want to assign higher weights to any object that affects the visible or functional aspect of above the fold content, uh, which Vesper can tell us as well. So to evaluate these schedulers, we loaded each page in our corpus over a 12 megabit per second link with a 100 millisecond RTT. Uh, and here are some results showing how these schedulers affect different metrics compared to a default browser. As you can see, each metric is most improved by the scheduler that directly targets it. But additionally, these results suggest that the correlation between these metrics is not strong enough such that optimizing for one metric will directly optimize for another. And finally, in the, in the last part of our evaluation, we wanted to understand how users actually felt about Ready Index. And so for this, we performed several user studies. Uh, in the first study, we considered users that wanted to interact with web pages. And so here, we showed users three versions of each page uh, that optimized for different metrics. And in each load, we asked them to perform an interactive task, which we showed them beforehand. Uh, we then asked which load was fastest for those tasks. Uh, an example of an interactive task included uh, performing a search or hovering over an icon until something popped up on the screen. Uh, in this study, we considered five sites from our corpus and 85 different users. And here are some summary results which list how often users found each scheduler to be the fastest. And as you can see, 83% of the time, users preferred the pages that optimized for ready index or interactivity. And in the second user study, we considered users that didn't want to interact with pages but instead only wanted to look at them. And so here, just like in the first study, we showed users three versions of each page, but here we only asked which loaded the fastest. And in this study, we considered 15 sites from our corpus and 73 different users. And here are some representative results where each bar represents a median user perceived load time for a given site scheduler combination, an error bar span from the 25th to the 75th percentile. And so the key takeaway here is that as expected, Polaris SI was actually considered the fastest since it directly optimizes for rendering speed. But, the, but Polaris RI is actually able to achieve user perceived load times within 4% of Polaris SI. And in fact, Polaris RI was considered the fastest on four out of these 15 pages.
And so these results suggest that Polaris RI is actually still competitive, even when only rendering is considered. Uh, so in conclusion, I've explained how existing performance metrics don't explicitly consider how users interact with web pages, leading to discrepancies in how well they actually relate to user experience. And so to overcome this, I presented an analytical definition for a new time to interactivity metric called Ready Index, as well as a practical system called Vesper that measures it. And with that, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, uh, hi, uh, Shankar from at and Labs. Um, great work. I, I really like the way you sort of built up, you know, a more concrete way of identifying the metric. But I was wondering if there are other events that roughly correlate to what ReadyNex index points to. For example, page loads typically have DOM content loaded events, right? Mm -hmm. Which sort of say, when is the DOM ready to be interactive at that point? Uh, do you know how it sort of correlates with readiness index? Yeah, so DOM content load, the, one of the key differences is this considers all of the page content, so everything that's basically statically referenced in the HTML. So there's no distinction between above the fold and below the fold. And so what we're really interested in with this metric is once the user is loading a page, what's the first, when can they actually start properly interacting? No, so there's I, no scrolling. I, but I, in terms I completely of, understand, but uh, I, mean, I was just wondering if you did a comparative <coughs> analysis as to if you just looked at DOM content load event, did you have to actually go through all this trouble to figure out when the ready next index needs to be completed? Yeah, so we did not do this with DOM content loaded. We did it with page load time, which is more the on load event uh, in the page. And so there, I mean, as we, there's uh, in this, table more or less and along as and similarly with the spikiness in the previous graphs we found that the correlation between these metrics it, there is a high level correlation if your page load time decreases there's a good chance that these others will decrease but the correlation is not strong enough such that if you really want to optimize for the metric you have to optimize for that specific metric okay um the, the uh, second <coughs> question i had was um Readiness is clearly not going to be binary, right? It's not like 100% or 0%. There's going to be a, a, a percentile. So um, in terms of, again, you know, the other metrics that you have mentioned in here, do you know at what percentile does the readiness index sort of match with the other, uh, you know, me measurement points that you have observed here? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, I mean, generally speaking, we know that there's the high level trend that load time, page load time will be larger than ready time than, than above the fold time, or similarly, ready index will be larger than speed index for a given site. Um, I don't think we've done that exact, exact comparison, although I think we have the data to do it. Um, I think uh, one of the important things to note, though, in what you said is that ready index is a progressive metric in that it's not, it's explicitly not saying that this is the time when everything is ready. It does track the progression. So, as I said, a page that loads content progressively with uh, some of that being interactive will have a better ready index score than one that loads all of it at the end, even if they finish at the exact same time. Uh, but we haven't done the exact comparison yet. Uh, MKGB from NetApp. Uh, I was looking at the page when you were talking about calculation and for the, you said that it need to be fully functional and fully visible. And then when you, when you try to calculate the element readiness, you scale both function by one half. Can you explain that for me? Why did you scale them by one half? Yeah, so the idea is that an element is fully ready when it's fully visible and fully functional. Our current implementation chose sort of generic values to say that we are going to weight the two properties equally. Uh, one thing that you can imagine is, you know, the way we've designed this is it's quite flexible. So if you're a site and you have, let's say, there's some content that you think is more important to be visible or functional, you can easily change those parameters. So the half was supposed to be more of a generic uh, weighting scheme across the two. Okay. Can other people use Vesper? Yeah, so we plan to release this basically after the conference, so in the next few weeks uh, we can look for that. Do I have another minute? Go ahead. Um, okay. So you're using public websites, so have you built your annotated pages inside of like a, a a caching system, is that how you did this? Yeah, so these experiments are done using a record and replay framework uh, for the exact reason that we can't control the actual backends in practice. Um, and so, you know, the perk of this model is that it allows developers to basically rewrite all of the content in a page no matter what domain it's coming from. In practice, another possible deployment model is to try to integrate similar tracing into the browser, uh, but there are sort of challenges in terms of how you would probe for interactivity. So that's something we're exploring now.
Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ravi. And Thank uh, I should have pointed out, uh, Ravi is on the uh, job market, very articulate talk. And uh, so if you'd like to have uh, this articulate thinker working for you, uh, please make sure to talk with him. Uh, next up. Oh, yeah. Okay.